this morning. We're actually going to be talking about Abram this morning. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis 14. It's good to be back gathered together in one place uh, and in body and not just in spirit. Amen. So I appreciate uh, those of you who joined us in our home last Sunday. That was kind of interesting. Tried to do something a little different. The kids wanted to do something. But yeah, you know how Adam had the powered platform entrance and stuff <laughs> a while back. We couldn't come up with anything that cool, but uh, it's still not a substitute for being here in person, amen? So it feels a little bit like a reunion this morning. I'm glad for everybody who's been able to get out, be here, and our thoughts and prayers are certainly with those who are uh, not well this morning. We have one at home who's pretty sick. I know Ezekiel was, was pretty sick, although I heard that his fever did break this morning, so good news on that front, and uh, of course with a, um, Amber as well and, and Justin at their home. I'd like to turn your thoughts uh, into this story that we find in the book of Genesis chapter number 14. Uh, this is right before Genesis chapter number 15, which of course <laughs> is important because that's uh, one of the most, uh, it's a really a pinnacle chapter in the life of Abram, uh, and it's a big big part of the gospel we preach today right and so it's part of that covenant that God made with Abraham and we read a lot about uh, Genesis 15 in Genesis chapter number 14 we have a story uh, that's recounted even uh, by the Holy Spirit through the author of the book of Hebrews uh, bringing to mind uh, the slaughter of the kings that Abraham uh, returned from and this is where we're first introduced to this man named Melchizedek uh, which the Holy Spirit later uses by the prophet David as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ and the priesthood that he was of. And so there's a lot of things coming out of these early chapters uh, where the Lord introduces us to these uh, people and these places and these events because later in his plan and in his purpose, he continues to bring to light greater truths from these things that we first are introduced to here. And it's interesting to put yourself into... Uh, the life and the time of these people because they didn't have the full story, right? They, we didn't they have at that time when they were walking the earth, they didn't know all the different things about the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, all the things that we have the benefit of looking back on this side of history and knowing and seeing with greater clarity. But there are some significant lessons that we find in Genesis chapter number 14 that I hope to share with you this morning, God's Spirit helping me, that we might be able to learn and glean some things that will help us in our own lives as well. I'd like you to stand with me this morning. As we get started, we're going to turn our attention to this chapter, and we're going to read through verse number 16. Uh, we're, not going to, we're not going to focus much on the part of the story where Abraham meets Melchizedek and all these kinds of things, but we are going to read these first verses and talk a little bit about this battle that Abram became involved in. It says in verse number one of chapter 14, and it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Eleazar, Ch Chedarleomer, which by the way, I did uh, look that up online and had the little Hebrew guy pronounce it for me. He didn't even pronounce it right. He didn't say it. <laughs> he didn't say it anything close to like what it sounds like in my head. Uh, so I'm not even going to try. Uh, king of Elam and title king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Chedarleomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came that same guy, and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephaims, and Ashtoreth, Kernaim, and the Zuzims, and Ham, and the Emims, and Sheva, Kirathiam. Close enough. So obviously there's a lot of really difficult names in here. We're not going to focus on the names this morning, so it's okay if we don't get it quite right. And the Horites and their Mount Seir, unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came to Enmeshvat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazizon Tamar. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar. We remember that from Lot's story, you may remember. And they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim, where Chedorlaomer and the king, of, the king of Elam, with title king of nations, and Amraphel king of Shinar, and Ariok king of Elisar, four kings, 
with five. In other words, uh, it was four against five. And the veil of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. And they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, the brother of Aner. And these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods, and the women also, and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chador Laomer, and the, of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons, and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eshcol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you this morning for your word, for the things that have happened before, and the fact that you've preserved them for us by your spirit, all down through these thousands of years since these things have happened you've continued to preserve your word just as you promised you would so that those who might come after and might live after these times and these men and these events could look back see your faithfulness and how you've worked by your servants and by the prophets through all these times and through all these ages to perform your word and to keep your promises father i just pray this morning as we attend our ears and our minds and our hearts unto the things that you've shared with us here this morning, that you might speak to us. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you might open our understanding, that you might persuade us more wholly and more fully of the things we ought to be doing that we're not, the things that we not be, should be doing that we are, and that we might in all things become more like Christ as we grow day by day, line by line, precept by precept in the things that you have for us in this life. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So other than a lot of really difficult reading uh, in this chapter, there's some really good nuggets in here, and I just hope to pull out a few of them. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful that uh, names we pick today are mostly short and easy to pronounce. You know, a lot of the big names are kind of out of style, aren't they? You go through the Bible, and there's some like Meher Hal Hashabaz or, and stuff like that, or something close to that. Uh, in Isaiah, there's a lot of big, long names, makes for really tough reading. Uh, so anyways, other than that aside, what I want to talk to you this morning is about this battle that Abraham became involved in <clears throat> and how we how we see the life of Abram and what the Lord has done in his life. So, I mean, the, the Lord at this point in his life has separated him from the house of his fathers, right? He's called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. And he said, I'm going to show you a land where you're going to be a stranger. And you're going to inherit this land, right? And, and it, you'll continue to be a stranger in it. And they have this whole conversation uh, that the Lord says, hey, I'm going to show you a land. Uh, and, and you're going to receive it someday in the resurrection. But you're going to wander there as a stranger, as a picture and a type. And if you really think about it, there's no, there was nothing necessitating Abraham coming out of Ur of the Chaldees for God to give him an inheritance in the world to come. But God commanded it of Abraham that Abraham, as the father of us all, might live and serve as a type for us because we're also called to be pilgrims and strangers. In other words, it wasn't necessary for Abraham to leave Ur just to receive the promise other than God said, I want you to leave Ur. And so he left Ur. Was the land of Canaan a godly place? Was it like a retreat where Abram could go? 
where things were more wholesome and, and more um, you know, family-oriented and more godly and, and those kind of things. No, we know uh, the land of Canaan, hello, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, it wasn't a godly place. But Abraham was called out of her to go there, and he served as an example to those people as well. And so he sojourned there in a land where he hoped to receive and expected to receive as an inheritance when God makes all things new. And like Jesus Christ said, in the kingdom of God, after the restoration of all things, many will come and they'll sit down with who? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all heirs of the same promise. So here in this portion of his life, we have Abram just following the Lord step by step. God has not revealed to him the entirety. Actually, in chapter number 15, uh, they're having a conversation. Abram is conversing with the Lord about, I still don't really understand how this is going to work, right? And so by degrees, God is just leading Abraham. And every time the Lord reveals something to Abram, then Abram would act. What's really interesting about this chapter is that Abram is, becomes involved in a battle that really wasn't his, but it was. It's a battle that really wasn't his, but it was. And in this chapter, Abram is acting uh, seemingly from everything we know on everything he knew about who God is, what his place in this life was, and what he was expected to do. It's not like God had given him in this instance, this is one of the few instances where Abram's acting without direct uh, communication from God saying, hey, go do this. But he found himself in a situation that required him to act. And the Bible teaches us that, that God has not revealed to us today every answer to every decision that you may ever encounter. God has not, he hasn't done that. He hasn't chosen to reveal to us. This is called the mystery of his will. Because in spite of all of us doing uh, our own kind of thing as best we can find out and know how and are led by the Spirit and in the midst of all of this seeming chaos, God's will is being fulfilled. It's being accomplished to a T. Every purpose that he has purposed under heaven, it's all being established, and it's all being carried out in keeping with his will. So God's not revealed everything, but he has told us this, you're answerable to me. So go live your life, Seek me in the things that you're called to do. Be obedient to Christ in the things that are uh, manifest. In other words, they've been revealed to us. A lot of things, uh, we don't have to wonder what Christ wants from us because he has taught us. But in some areas, I mean, you might want to go with Progressive or State Farm, right? I mean, it's, it's a choice, and you have to make it. And there, there's likely decisions, especially if you choose Allstate, uh, and you ever need a claim. There's repercussions to your choices, right? It's... It may not always work out perfectly. Uh, so we're going to, in many of those instances, do the best we can to navigate life knowing that he hasn't told us everything. He's told us what we need to know. He's told us that he'll be with us. And he's told us that we're supposed to go live unto him and that when this whole thing is over, Jim talked about this on Wednesday night, when this whole thing's over, we're going to stand before him and give an account. So... With that knowledge, go live, right? That's, that's what he's sent us to do with a lot of things to do, some guidance and some counsel to live by. And he said, go live. And it's appointed unto men once to die, right? We all have that meeting. This is like the longest rabbit trail of ever, all time, just to get the stage set here. We all have that meeting, that appointed time, right? It's appointed to us to die once, and after that, the judgment. In other words, after that, what? After we die, God is going to make a decision about us. That's what the judgment is. It's God's judgment. He's using, what, when we say someone exercises their judgment, it's their ability to decide about things. So God is going to make a decision about each of us. And he's told us how he's going to make those decisions. Right? Who's going to be told, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord? And who's going to be told, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity? He's told us in advance, this is how I'm going to decide 
And that's, we're going to have that moment of judgment. So it's appointed to die. Then there's a decision about us. And some people are going to face a second death. So it's appointed to die once. Then a decision by God about us. And some will enter into life. And some are going to die twice. It's, a, it's the lot that we face in this world. So in the midst of all that, what do we see from Abram? Just a few things this morning that we see of Abram as he reacts to a situation probably not much different than yours or mine. In other words, there are times in our life when we don't know exactly what we ought to do. I find this to be especially true in so many areas of life, but one that's easy to maybe uh, communicate to those of you who have been parents, and since we were dealing with some of this this week, uh, when you're a parent and you have a child, especially a young child who's very ill, you don't always know what to do, do you? Yeah. And sometimes it's a little scary because I remember with our first kid, uh, Constance, we call her the experiment <laughs> because with your first one, you just don't know. You just don't know. And so you're just kind of flying by the seat of your pants and you're taking counsel from people who've Take, walk that path before you but it's kind of like reading the instruction manual uh, you can read all about it and what other people tell you works or doesn't work but until you start putting those things into practice and kind of find your way through it uh, it's tough so you have a child who's very very ill sometimes it's tough to know does it seem like everybody's kid gets sick on friday night it's always friday night it's always the weekend. The doctor's offices are right. They're closed, and it's going to be an ER trip if it's anything. Should we wait till Monday? Is it going to be fine till then? Maybe we shouldn't. We should. You're always kind of in this conundrum where you don't exactly know what to do. And sometimes life is kind of that way. Sometimes life's kind of that way. Abram finds himself in this kind of a situation. You might remember that at this point in history, uh, Abram and Lot have parted their ways that Abraham had told Lot, he said, if you want to take to the right, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. But Abram's motivation was, let there be no strife. Let there be no strife. We're brethren. It's not reasonable that we should strive with one another. So as the heads of these households that are striving, let's make decisions for our households that will allow the households to be at peace. Right? They took that responsibility, and Abram said, look, Something has to change. Our servants are striving with each other all the time. So as the heads of the household, let's make a change. And so they did that. And now Lot, you might remember, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. It was a good-looking place. Uh, everything was well-watered. Plenty of, uh, it, was, it was not apparently like what it is today. Because you look at pictures from today, and it's like, how does life survive there? It's just a wilderness. It's almost like they find those little microbial life forms in the Antarctic. And you're like, how does that live there? And it's kind of that way in this area of Israel. To look at it, it's just rocks. I mean, it's, there's nothing that leads you to believe this is. But it says in the, in the text that it was like the garden of God. It was well watered everywhere. And there was a lot going on to support life. Made it look very desirable. Lot chose that. Now, sometime later, we find Lot caught up in somebody else's battle, right? He's hanging out with the world. He's doing the world stuff. He's more interested in kind of the life. And I think as we study his life, I'm guessing his wife is a big driver in his decision-making to move into the city. Because we see who was it that looked back and was turned into a pillar of salt? It's Lot's wife. And the Bible says the Lord knows how to deliver the righteous, right? And his, his wife was not delivered in that situation. She, she came out part way, looked back in disobedience, turned to a pillar of salt. So clearly her heart was there. That's kind of where she wanted to be. She's in Lot's ear. I'm, I'm supposing as a married man, she's in Lot's ear a little bit about how nice it would be to be in the city and everything else. And Lot's like, okay, we'll move to the city. We'll have this. We'll, we'll have all the luxuries it affords. But now, whenever the world's in this uh, struggle and in this fight and things aren't working out, guess who gets caught up in it? Lot. And guess what? It'll always be that way. So Lot gets tangled up in the world, and then he gets completely carried away, literally carried away. He's, he's a captive. He gets carried away with the world. And notice what happens in verse number 13. It says, there came one. 
In verse number 13, there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew. Interesting to me how God prepares. How many times in Scripture do we see there was one? Right? Remember the life of Job. Every time there was an, uh, a bad event that just happened, whether it's his camels getting taken by the Sabaeans or the house falling in on his family or all these different things happened in a day, and it says there came what? One. So God appoints a messenger. He appoints a messenger. There just happened to be, by the way, this one who just happened to escape just happened to know that Abram would be interested and had a vested interest in these events and just happened to come find Abram and tell him, hey, this is what's going on. You know, the things that we hear in life are not a coincidence. The messengers that God sends into our life are not a coincidence. Sometimes we're not as thankful as we should be for the messengers he sends. Right? I know some of our young people have gotten pulled over by police officers recently. Okay? Who is that? There's a lot of people uh, who kill themselves on America's roadways every year who never had the luxury of being getting a warning message. Never had the luxury of God sending somebody directly into their life to say, look, you need to stop and think about what the choices you're making. And I'm going to give you an opportunity. God appoints a messenger. And it happens in small ways like that. I've had my own share of them, mostly in my youth. Uh, I think the last time I was pulled over was for, uh, I'm probably going to, I'm going to make a liar of myself. I did get a ticket when I wrecked my vehicle. Uh, the, the highway patrolman came all the way to the hospital and fined me, and that was nice. And he... <laughs> We had a very pleasant exchange. He wrote me a ticket. Uh, but I got pulled over for not wearing a seatbelt. And now I have kids who tell me, hey, Dad, put on your seatbelt. Right? So that's worked out better. I did get a speeding ticket that I'm pretty sure was the other guy's. He passed me going pretty fast, and I got pulled over. I never figured that out. But in all those things, uh, I did run a stop sign. That one was mine. Got a ticket for that. Right? So we get what? We get messengers. There's a lot of people who do stupid stuff, and there's never a policeman there to see them. But God was concerned enough with my life to make sure there's somebody there Amen. to say, look, you're young and dumb. That's great. But at a certain point, you've got to grow up and take responsibility. And God will send people into your life in those little ways to say, hey, this is a messenger. It's a messenger. You hear me? Because how's God going to speak to you anyway? Is he, is he going to come down and visit you like he did with Abram? No, he's going to send a messenger into your life. And what I'm saying is that none of those things are coincidence. Those things are appointed. They're appointed by God as he visits with his angels about how things are going in your life. Say, hey, you know, I think this kid could use a wake up. And God says, I want you to go sit. I mean, we, we get interesting little, little previews of conversations that happen around the throne. And it's interesting that God's talking about his creation. In large part, the lives of men and, and how he is interacting with their lives to direct and to move. And I don't think this messenger was just a coincidence. This messenger had something to share with Abram. And what's interesting is that God doesn't, doesn't come to Abram and say, hey, this is what's happened and here's what I want you to do. It's not as clear as that. But he did appoint a messenger to carry a message and what was the message that Abram got? Because all the messenger does is share with Abram, this is what happened. He's, he's, that's all he did. He just said, this is what's happened. In other words, Abram, this is the situation. This is, this is just what happened, and this is the situation as it stands today. That your nephew was down there with those people, and this other king came in, uh, and overthrew them and carried them all away. That's it. No additional direction, no request asking him to do anything, just news, just information. And sometimes in our life, don't you find that's the way it kind of is? 
You're just going to get, this is how it is. And in response to that, you're supposed to do what? Well, something. So what was the message that Abram got? Yes, the message, the news was that his nephew had been taken captive. But what was the message? Well, I think the message was that he had a brother in need. He had a brother in need. And I think Abram knew enough to know that a brother is worth fighting for. A brother's worth fighting for. Don't you think so? How many of us have people in our lives that we have news about, we have information about what's happening in their life, and we receive that news with nothing else to operate on, what message? What's the message? I think Abram would say a brother is worth fighting for. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 6? He says that if there's one of you that falls into sin, those among you who are spiritual, do what? Act. Do. Go. Fight for that one. Right? Fight to see them restored. And so there is a responsibility that's incumbent upon us when we see a brother in need to say, let's, let's act on the information we have and let's see if we can't make a difference. Let's see if we can't intervene in the circumstance and do something to bring about some good, some restoration, some healing. And so that's what Abram did. I think by our faith, we're called into this fight. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Our faith in God's word calls us into this battle. We've received the news. We know what the situation is. We know there are brothers. This is similar to the, the picture of the children of Israel going into the uh, land of Canaan when those who had already received their inheritance were not suffered to rest until all of their brethren had gotten theirs as well. And as Christians, it's incumbent upon us to realize that while our soul is secure in the Savior, and we have, we have a promise of a rest in Christ, and we can know for certain that our names are written in the book of life, and that we have forgiveness through His blood, and that the atonement for our sins is complete, and it's sufficient, we can have all confidence in the Savior for ourselves. The fact is that some of our brothers have yet to be delivered. Some of our brothers are still in captivity. And it's not good enough for us to just be satisfied. Abraham, when he receives this news, he's good. The battle didn't affect him. He's at peace. He's secure. He's provided for. Everything is, is well with Abram. But everything was not well with Abram as long as it was not well with his brothers. And Abraham took that to heart. Not because God commanded it, but because it was his nature and character to be so by the working of God's spirit in him. So Abram was not, he was not well with that. And some might say, well, yeah, but Abram, he, he had it pretty easy because he just had to go fight this one time. Uh, you're telling me that this is basically a, a lifelong battle uh, that I'm called to uh, in the spirit, and our warfare is not carnal. Uh, but Abram, you know, he, he lived a life, and he just this one time he had to go, uh, go fight with these guys. None of us have ever had to fight for our life with a sword. Are you telling me you prefer that? I know some of the young and dumb among us say yes. This is why they, re it's why they recruit 18-year-olds for the military. Because they're, so they're like, yeah, sounds like fun. Until they're in the middle of the heat of battle, and all of a sudden their definition of fun changes. But nonetheless, we haven't had to do that. We've not yet resisted unto blood. Paul says, striving against sin. What I'm telling you is Abram did both. He lived a life fighting the spiritual battles, and beyond that, 
also had to get into a phrase like this, where his own physical well-being was at risk as he labored to secure his brother's deliverance. And so I think we've got it kind of easy by comparison. But Abraham serves as an example. After telling Tim, uh, Timothy in 1 Timothy to fight this good fight, in his second epistle to Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, I've done it. I have fought, he says, a good fight. What's he telling the young preacher? It can be done. Not by your own strength, but by God's strength working in you, it can be done. And Paul labored to be an example that the young preacher could look at his life and say, it can be done. There's an example to follow. And our young people need to see that there's a fight to be fought, there are brothers worth fighting for, and that it can be done. They need to see some examples of that working out in older men's and older women's lives. They need to see older men who know what it means to serve Christ as the head of their home. Not as lords over God's heritage, but as examples to their flock. Look, if the qualifications for running a home is what's necessary to be a pastor, then clearly the best way to be a father is the best way to be a pastor. So when the instruction is to the men who are pastors, you're not lords over the heritage, you're examples. If, if God's telling that to the pastor, then it's very easy to look at every father and say what? That this, if it fits for the pastor, it fits for the father. Because the qualification for being a pastor is to know how to be a father. So when we say you're not lords over God's heritage, the home that you lead, the family that you serve, is God's heritage, and you're a steward of it. So what are you to do? Don't lord over it. Be an example to it. Be an example to it. What do we see next in this life? So Abraham gets the news. He gets the message he makes a decision. He's decisive. I love that. I love the fact that Abraham decides and he acts. So many times in life, we get hung up on indecision. You know you have a brother in need, but you're not sure what to do, so we do nothing. We know there are those who are in spiritual captivity we would seek to see them delivered, but we don't know how to fight, so we do nothing. Abraham didn't lead his home this way. Abraham decided. He didn't know in this moment if this is right, if it's going to work out, if everything's going to be the way he envisions or hopes or plans, but he makes a decision and he acts. And the decision comes down to this. I can assure my own safety and comfort and well-being by not becoming involved or I can risk all of those things to try to be involved. And he chose to risk everything and he went and he got involved. He made a decision. He took an action. An inaction is almost the worst thing you can do. It's a terrible way for a man to lead his home, to be indecisive. Just as bad, if not worse, is arbitrary decisions, right? Just being arbitrary with your authority and arbitrary with the decisions you make. That's, that's almost as bad as being indecisive. What do we need? We need decisions that provide direction, which is what Abram does. Notice what we see from the text. After he gets the message, it says in verse number 14, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, right? That was, that was all he needed to know. Notice what happens. It says that he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them. What did he say? We're going to do something, and here's how we're going to do it. And they went and they did it. But before I, I, before I want to lead you into that line of thinking, I want you to notice from verse number 14 something that was very important. 
one word in this whole verse that makes all the difference. He armed his trained servants. Abraham had already been preparing for this day. And not only himself, but he had been preparing his entire household. Man, when you start to see some of what God says about Abraham, a lot of the things God has to say about Abraham have to do with how he led his home, how he commanded his home. And we get a little bit of insight into that in this passage because we see it a story that Abram had already been training his household. Did Abram know when the battle would come? No, but he knew it was coming. Did Abram know who the enemy would be? No, but he knew there would be an enemy. Did he know the circumstance under which they may ever need to exercise these skills? No, he probably couldn't imagine uh, that this would be the occasion that his nephew's taken captive, and now they've got to go in on a, a rescue mission. Probably didn't imagine that. But when it came, he was prepared. I can't tell you this morning when the enemy's coming to visit your home. I can't tell you what the circumstances will be when he pays a visit to your family. I can't tell you the nature and the extent of the things that will be going on and all of the ancillary circumstances that will surround the particular story or narrative that's taking place in your life and the life of your family when the enemy comes. But I can tell you he's coming. He's coming. Are you preparing? Are you training the servants of the household to know how to fight when the day comes? I love that Abram is that example. He didn't wait to see what would happen and then try to react to it. He had been preparing for things he didn't know about. So many times in our homes we fail because we wait for the event to happen and then we try to arm servants who are not prepared. They're not trained. They don't know and they're not equipped. When we look at the word trained, it means instructed, tried, and experienced. There's a lot that goes into training, isn't there? Training is not long lectures into the night. Long lectures into the night happen when training has failed. Long lectures into the night happen when, when training has failed to meet its objective. And now we're triaging the wounded. We're triaging the wounded. I'm talking about training. I'm talking about a program. I'm talking about discipline that is goal-oriented towards producing people that are equipped for the battle that looms ahead. Because it's coming. Abram knew it in his day, and he had taken some steps for his household. There ought to always be training going on in our homes. Always be training. Every day, every circumstance, rising and setting, all the things that God says about his word and how it's used in our lives and in our homes, every experience is a training opportunity. You don't get up and go to, the work, go to work in the morning without understanding why it's necessary. And it's taking time to teach your children about where you're going and why you're going there. Because everything centers around Christ for the child of God. It all centers around our service to Him. And our children need to understand from a young age that fact. That there is a motivation behind what mom and dad do for them because they're not going to understand it. And that's the whole point. If we wait till the children are old enough to understand, we've missed the opportunity to train them. You cannot wait until the heat of battle to put a spear in your servant's hand and hope for the best. Training ought to be going on 
all the time. And what does it mean? Well, it means when the battle comes to our doorstep, our children have been instructed. That's the first step of training, instruction. It's not the end, it's the beginning. So providing instruction. And how do we instruct? In meekness, in love, and in truth. Your children need to know there is a standard of truth that is from God himself. You didn't come up with it. You're striving to attain unto it. You're not the author of it. And so they've hopefully seen examples in your life where you've confessed that you didn't meet the standard and that they've heard from your mouth that you have failed, that you have sinned. That I'm sure these stories got told in Abram's household as he was raising Isaac and telling him all of the stories that, I mean, Ishmael didn't just appear. Isaac's raised in a household with an Ishmael. Of course, he's cast out when he's, I forget how old he was. Does anybody know? Is it 13 or 14? Ish. But he's raised in a home that has that tension that only exists because mom and dad failed. They didn't get it right. And you know what? We're kidding ourselves if we think we got it right. We're kidding ourselves. We didn't get it right. We strove. We tried. And we did what every generation before us has done. We fell short. We fell short. And our kids need to know we fell short. But we're striving. It's one thing to fall short. It's another to give up. We're striving. We're growing. We're learning. Me and my wife feel like we grow up with our kids. Because as they're growing as children, we're learning to be parents. And maybe about the time they're grown, we'll be like, oh, that's what it was to be a parent. Because it went by. And we were learning through the process. Right? And so you're, you get to the end only to realize you've just learned what you should have had at the beginning, but didn't. So here we are, and now your children are going into the battle, and are they prepared? Well, yes and no. There will be casualties, there will be losses, there will be wounds, there will be damage, and we'll have to triage. But triage should not be the plan. There got to be some training. So instruction is important, but instruction is not everything. If I give you a bunch of instruction in something and never let you put any of it into use, you don't know a thing about it. You only know what I've ever told you about. I mean, I, I'm trying to, if there's something I knew how to do well, I don't even know. I feel like I can do some things, maybe quite a variety of things, mediocre. But something I, I knew how to do, if I just told you how to do it, let's say, uh, who in here would like to know how to play a little piano but doesn't play any piano? Okay, Miss Lisa. If I got up every Sunday for the next year and explained how to play the piano but never let you touch a piano, how would the training program work out? You should know how to play a piano after a year of instruction, Miss Lisa. At some point, there has to be opportunity to try. And, and this is a tricky one that every parent who's ever lived has struggled to understand or figure out. But you don't, I don't train for a year or two and then sign her up for the state fair contest. <laughs> right? The instruction has to come in degrees. Opportunity to try has to be received in measure. And with that comes the third ingredient, which is experience. But there's got to be a measured approach to instruction and trial and experience. So before my kids ever come of age and I just say, hey, you're old enough because you just happened to stay alive. Congratulations. <laughs> So now mom and dad are leaving for the weekend and you've got the house to yourselves because you reached a magical age of maturity by staying alive long enough that says you ought to be capable. Before I get there, there has to be some training, which means instruction and trial and experience. 
in the little things. And if a child cannot perform in the little things, they do not move on in the program. This is the way it works. If you cannot perform, and, and you say, well, you know, my, by the time these kids are Justice's age, where he's over here trying to just barely stay awake in church uh, and act like he's half interested in what I'm saying, if I wait till I'm Justice's age to try to figure out the program, then he's already got his own ideas of what he thinks is cool, what he thinks is important, what he thinks is fun, and he's doing his own thing. So the training doesn't start when he's got the maturity to be exercised in the big things. The training starts when they're six months old, and I say, no. And we have got to be a couple of things, consistent. It's less, I was you know, talking recently about, um, I was overhearing, uh, and there was someone in this congregation, and I don't, I don't say this because um, because I'm trying to pick on anybody, but I overheard a conversation talking about the type of discipline that we choose for different kids because there are differences, right? Not the same thing works for every kid. Anybody figure that out with kids yet? Yeah, so not the same thing works for every kid. You have to train up every child according to their way, right? They're all going to learn a little different way, and you train them up accordingly because they're all different. However, less important... I want you to hear it from me, and I'll not back down from this statement. Less important than the type of discipline you use is the consistency with which it's applied. When you say something, mean it, or shut your mouth. As a parent, you cannot afford to water down your credibility. Because the moment your one-year-old knows they don't really mean it, you've lost. You have no opportunity to interact with them the way God intended for parents to interact with their children when you've lost your credibility. So less important than how you discipline them when they've already missed the point of the program, and now we're bringing them back to, okay, lesson 16 again, because we can't go to lesson 17. We're going to do lesson 16 again. More importantly than the type of discipline used to bring them back is the consistency with which mom and dad interact with their kids day in. Day out, day in, day out, morning, evening, noon, night, lunch, dinner, supper, breakfast, not necessarily in that order. All I'm saying is that you've got to interact with them in a way that trains them. How t- Your children are learning how to think. They're learning how to think. Think of, think of how big the implications are for your children who are learning under your guidance how to think. They're developing a mind from a young age, from from the ages of one to five to six and seven, they're learning how to think, how to have a mind, how to exercise that mind. By the time they get to 15 to 20, they're now out in the world. And you know what they realize? That it's not just about having a mind that knows how to think. Now I'm a mind in a world of minds. Then it turns out there's a lot of different things to think. And now I go from being just my mind to sitting into a context of I'm in a world of minds and how do I find my way? Well, if they haven't had any training, they're not going to find their way. They've got to be prepared. And you say, preacher, you're really belaboring this point this morning. Praise God. Praise God. We have got to get this down that above everything else as a parent, providing things is nice. I love going to work uh, and I love working hard so that I can have a little bit of resources because I love giving things to my children. I would rather, I don't even care about stuff for me. There's really nothing in life that appeals to me but I love the joy on their faces when they get to do something, when they get to experience something, when they get to go somewhere. And so if I have to work hard to give them the opportunity to do something, that's awesome because they're children. I'm supposed to be the mature one. I'm supposed to be weaned from the things of this life. They're still going to go through that process. So sometimes 
Uh, I think Christian homes place all the burden on the children to say, this life is not for enjoying. Don't enjoy your life, right? That's how it comes across to children because they're young. They're not weaned yet. Spiritually, even if they're born again, they're not weaned yet. We're supposed to be the mature ones. Let them enjoy some things in life, but teach them what they're for. Part of the training. So we're going to spend some time thinking about training our children, which involves those three things, instruction, trial, and experience. It ought to always be going on, and it does take time. It's going to require your time, time that you might prefer be doing other things, but you don't have that luxury as a parent because you are, you are the, you're their trainer. I mean, I don't, I was not in the military. I was, I played sports. I don't know if that's probably not meaningful to anybody. <laughs> but the guy who's, who's supposed to be doing the coaching, he doesn't have the luxury of enjoying the sport. He may love to play, but he's had to die to that so he can be a coach. If you're a parent, yeah, there's a lot of things in life that you could enjoy. It's not that you don't enjoy life, but there are things you will have to die to to do your job well. Things that will simply distract you. Your job as a parent is not is not just to delegate everything to the children. You have to be involved. Amen. You've got to be engaged. You've got to be in the trenches with them because that's where the relationships are fired, where that, where that actually happens, where you're in the trenches living life with those kids, and that's where those relationships are strengthened and those bonds are made that will, are intended to last beyond the age of 18. So important. Spending the time. Giving them the opportunity to try. Being comfortable with the idea that they will fail just like you because they're in your image. But if they're going to fail, let's let them fail on the little lessons and teach them before the consequences become so great. You wait until they're too big, too mature, can do too much damage to themselves, and then you let them go try. The consequences are much greater. So let them try in little ways and be okay with the fact that they will fail. You should not be angry with your children when they fail. They're, it's really just a mirror of your image. They're showing us who we are and reminding us that we fail regularly. It's just that our Heavenly Father isn't so immediately present in the flesh to, to be as mindful right about the failures that we have. We could all be failing right now today. Right? You could have plans as an adult today for yourself this afternoon that your Heavenly Father would say, Son, I'm not very happy about that. I, I don't think that's what you ought to be doing with your time. I don't think that's a good use of your effort this afternoon. I think there's some other things you could do for someone else besides yourself that would be a better use of your time. And as your Heavenly Father, I would like to encourage you to think about doing something differently. See, we get the luxury as adults of just imagining that our Heavenly Father is always pleased. He's just glowing and radiating from ear to ear with favor and sunshine as he observes our life, right? There are certainly those times, but a lot of a father's time is spent correcting. <coughs> correcting. And I think we as his children need to realize that he has some correcting to do. I think of Christ speaking to the churches in Revelation. He had a lot of correcting to do. Why? Because he's a good father. He's involved. He knows what's happening in their lives. He's engaged. He's in the details. He's interested in what's happening in their lives. It's not a nuisance. It's not an obligation. It's his fun. So we should have some things to strive for to be like him in that area. 
Can I say of Christ that he has trained his servants in his household? Hasn't he? I mean, that's a lot of what the scriptures teach us, a lot of what the church is intended to be as this body of saints and believers to encourage one another, provoke one another, and yes, at times admonish one another and say, look, brother, I love you, uh, but we've got to do better here. As a group, as a family, as a church, we've got to grow. We've got to, we've got to be motivated by God's spirit to move on and press ahead to achieve more in his name. We can't be comfortable. We can't be complacent. We can't just be idle. We can't rest on our laurels because everything's just peachy and fine with us. There's, there's a battle to be fought. And the news of it has reached my ears, and, and we've got to be engaged. There's things to do to press ahead so that the day might be won and deliverance might be gained for someone else. Christ has trained his servants. We've been instructed. We've been tried. We've been given experience through successes, through failures. We've learned to exercise our spiritual senses to discern good and evil. We've learned to prove what is good and acceptable and pleasing in his sight. We've been exercised as his servants in his household to know that the battle's coming. And you're going to be called upon to use the training I've given you. As Christians, when we mature into that place to realize that he's been training us for use, for service, for something, right? He's, he's calling us into that. This is the whole point of the training program. You say, well, why didn't he just take us home whenever, uh, whenever he saved me? He could just take me home then because that's not the point. Amen. There's more to this picture than just us. There's more than just me and my little life and my dreams for myself and, and me going to heaven because that's a great place for me to be because there's work to be done. There's a battle to be fought. There are brothers in captivity who need deliverance yet. And their souls are in jeopardy and their souls are on the line. And the one who has taken them captive uh, is not a pleasant taskmaster. He's playing for keeps. And so should we. Abram responds to the message. You guys want to save some of this for tonight? It's quarter past. There's so much good stuff in this example that Abram gives us. But none of it would have been possible. None of it. His entire outlook, his entire response... Everything that he did from the moment he first heard the news was made possible because he'd been preparing. When you have not prepared, you don't have the same options. You don't have them. The options you will have in the future in how you respond to these kinds of situations when they come will be dictated in large part by the preparation you make today. The response that you will be able to have when that child gets to be 17, 18, 19, and 20, in large part is dictated by the preparation that you make when they are 3, 4, and 5. When you are teaching them how to think, how to view the world, how to view life, how to view relationships, how to interact with mom and dad, what to make of God's word. Who's really in charge around here? Is it mom and dad? Because if it is, it's pretty arbitrary. But if it's the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. So a lot of these things that they seem so elementary and rudimentary at a young age that we often leave them undone are the very things that we will be leaning on heavily when these children come of age and need to be trained for the fight. Some of them end up being the ones in captivity. Lot did great while he was in Abram's shadow, following Abram. But the moment he stepped outside of Abram's leadership and began to lead on his own, 
It's just a continued progression of self-destruction. Lot went out from Abram, a wealthy man. His substance was so great was the reason they had to part. He left Lot with his life and two daughters and the clothes on their back. Saved so as by fire. Such a great opportunity wasted. All of his substance brought to nothing and it was all so predictable. I think we'll, we'll pick up from here tonight. There's a couple more things that I, I think are important to this story. But we'll leave, it, we'll leave it there this morning, that preparation. You know, it's, it's good and it's great. Uh, you know, a couple weeks ago I preached at the young people because I love them and I'm concerned for them. But preaching at young people uh, really misses the point if their parents aren't listening. Because all through scripture, we find that God speaks to the authority and then works it down. I know that some parents are reached by evangelizing their children. But in the house of God, in the house of God, where things are supposed to follow the order he has ordained, is never intended to work that way. In God's house, his ways are to be followed. In God's house, his family is supposed to conduct themselves under the authority and the, the ways that he has instructed us in. So important. So while it's great and all the adults, uh, we can sit back and amen and cheer and yay because they all needed to really hear that. And they did. I don't know if any of them listened, but they needed to hear it. But who else needs to listen? The parents. We have got the lion's share of responsibility because we have been made stewards over this household and our leadership will go a long long way in their life to do one of two things lead them to Christ or to draw them from Christ what kind of things do mom and dad think are fun when your kid is two and three and four and five those are the very things your kids will think is fun when you, when you enjoy coming to the house of God and rejoice in the presence of God and the Holy Spirit and His Son, Jesus Christ, your children, when they're young, they rejoice to be here too. But when mom and dad light up because they get to go home and do uh, cards or movies or outings and all this other stuff that has no affiliation with Christ at all, and that's the focus of the family's thinking and fun, guess what the children learn? This is, this is what fun is. See, in every, in every area of life, from the music you listen to, the kind of entertainment you choose for yourself, all of it sets up to either lead your children to Christ or to draw them out into the world. Right, and we have a big responsibility, and it all starts with training. And if you'll do the training early, young, like Solomon says, he says, chasten thy son while there's hope. There's no hope chastening an 18-year-old. Very little hope that an 18-year-old will be chastened by their parents with any success. Very little hope that a 20-year-old will be chastened by their parents with any success. But a 3-year-old, 4-year-old, 5-year-old, they will respond to affectionate training from their parents. They come out of the womb hungry for it. It's through our coldness to them that they learn to be cold and indifferent to us. And children who are neglected and not trained learn that behavior. Whether or not relationships are important to them starts in the home. Starts with their own experience when they're learning and being trained from us. Your options will be different when it matters most if you put in the training and the time early. And you say, well, I'm not even a parent. This whole morning sermon was a waste. Right? I'm not even a, I don't even have kids. Yes, you do. If you're a member of this church, you have children to look after. Amen. We are the family of God, Amen. and we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we all have a responsibility in that. Jesus Christ said that, one, that all of us, that it would be better for a millstone to be hanged around our neck and cast into the sea. 
you want to know what Christ thinks about children and how they're treated, read that verse. He would rather take us, the adults, and take a millstone, tie it around our neck, and throw us in the ocean than for us to be an occasion of stumbling or offense to one little one. He thinks the world of little ones. They're full of faith. They're full of love. They're full of life. And they, they do it all to the glory of God. And so they're to be respected for that. Amen? We could learn a lot from them. We could learn a lot from Abram, from how he ran his household. And I think we should consider that this afternoon, maybe tonight. We'll pick it up from there and finish up uh, the story and see. It's a bit of a cliffhanger. We don't know how it turns out yet, but we'll get there tonight. Brother Adam, if